All right, says we're live. And we are live today for the first time ever. I've been watching him from afar for two years now, going oh one day I'm going to get this man on my channel and I'm going to be so happy. We have the eminence, his eminence, Paul Vanderclay, uh, brought YouTube, not, not that new of a YouTuber, relatively new YouTuber extraordinaire, Peterson expert, and John Verveke expert, and hopefully we'll be covering all those bases. He may have even met both of them, I believe. Uh, welcome, John. You want to introduce, or welcome, Paul. You want to introduce yourself? Oh, Paul, my name. Ah, Paul, yeah. <laughs> well, my name is Paul Vanderclay, and I do make YouTube videos. And I have uh, not met either. I've met Jordan Peterson in the flesh. I've shaken his hand uh, a few times. Uh, met John Verveke uh, only over the internet. And John and I have actually had more substantive conversations than I've had with Jordan. So, um, but I'm a pastor of a local church. I started making YouTube videos because I figured people didn't read books. And we don't, then, we definitely don't. Books yeah, are for nerds. Yeah. YouTube is where it's at. Yeah. So, and, and because I, I, it was just dumb luck, I suppose, uh, that Calvinists shouldn't say such things that, um, that my YouTube videos about Jordan Peterson got some traction and then a following happened and I've, been doing meetups and I, my YouTube channel is just kind of a thinking out loud channel and then having conversations with uh, with just about anybody. So that's sort of what I do. Yes, I've, I've noticed that you have, there's a couple of things about your YouTube channel. First off, you were, I'll just give you a background on us with Verveke before I start. Uh, we have a Verveke chat group, me, John, and one of the guys, I believe, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, one of the one of the guys I believe was on. He streamed with you a couple of times. He was involved in cults or something. He's been on your. Oh, channel. Nick. Yes, Nick. Nick streams with us. Oh, I wonderful. Was, I was thinking oh, Nick's Brett. great. Brett's the other guy. Yeah, he's he yeah, really smart guy. He's yeah. uh he's in the group and this other guy Brett who I don't believe you know, um, but we we stream once a week about when we're going through the whole meaning crisis. Oh, um, really? I didn't know that. Yes. The other thing is you, I don't think it was luck so much as you seem to get it right in streaming about Jordan Peterson right at the beginning of the Jordan Peterson wave, as far as I can tell, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, timing was, was really good for me. Right. I mean, right when those, those, when he was starting, I remember um, about two years ago, I, I was online with Twitter dealing with atheists and I was shopping Peterson around to them. And nobody had heard of him at that point. And I was like, did you atheists, you guys will probably like him because he was more, you know, he's more scientific. He's more, um, I figured that the atheists would actually appreciate his approach to Christianity. And at that point, nobody had heard of him. And that was probably right about when you started, you know, six months later, everybody basically a household name in our area. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do, Craig? I don't know hardly anything about you. Um, well, I just run. I, I, I'm on Twitter doing apologetics. Um, I started this up about three years ago. Okay. Um, kind of randomly. I, I just started a Twitter feed and just started interacting with atheists. And then, you know, it just kind of led to one thing. I was like, maybe I should start a YouTube channel. Then I started a YouTube channel. And then, you know, I got like a couple of well known atheists right at the beginning to interview. And, you know, so I've just been doing this for about, I guess, two years, kind of a, there's kind of a community of people who do this that I'm a part of. Okay. Um, you, you probably know some of them. So now you're, you're a pastor. You were a pastor for a long time, correct? I was ordained in 1991. Right. And so you, what, tell us about your church. You, you started a church. I didn't start a church. I was ordained in 91 and I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic for about seven years. And then I moved to Sacramento, California. The church was existent. They called me um, in the Christian Reformed Church. Pastors are sort of like free agents and Christian Reformed churches can call them. So I was called to this church and I've been at this church since 97. And yeah, it's a small church. It's extremely diverse. It's aging. Uh, it's, it's, it's aging quite quickly. It's the, the core of the group that started in the early 60s is now obviously up there in age. Um, oh, wow, the neighborhood yeah. is a struggling neighborhood in 
you know, what used to be suburban California, just kind of dilapidated suburbs now. And I've been here now 22 years and wow. I do what I do in my little church. And you start, so you started noticing, you started becoming interested in streaming because you got interested in Jordan Peterson first, because you saw the, 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 how it could apply to you, to your, like you were something about his approach or how'd that, how'd that happen? I had, I had been curious about the potential for YouTube before that. Right. Um, I had used Hangouts on the Air to record sermons so that people could see them. And, and you know, it's just, you know, looking for a no cost way to record sermons so that if someone missed a Sunday and they heard about a sermon, I could say, well, you'd give them a YouTube link and they'd find it. And right. then I had been, so really my first show on YouTube was the Freddie and Paul show where Freddie is a member of my church and he comes up to me, he had done public access TV stuff. He likes to rap. And he said to me one day, he said, pastor, you and I should do a TV show. And it's like, uh, I said, I'll tell you what, Fred, I'll, I'll, I'll use my smartphone and we'll make little, you know, five minute shows where you can rap and we can talk about sports and do whatever you want to. And that'll be our show. So I did that for about a year before I did anything with Jordan Wait, Peterson. rap, rap, rap as in, here's a little story about a brother like me. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what Freddie does. <laughs> you, you, if you haven't watched the Freddie and Paul show, you should watch it. There, um, There's a whole out. bunch of them on my channel. And right, so- man, Kick it, kick it, go, go for it. All right. I, I had, I had blogged for years. So I'm a pastor of a small church, but right. interested in following the culture and, you know, being a minister, you're always trying to take the Bible and whatever the world is now and sort of fit them together for the sake of, you know, the, the people of the church. Making and it relevant. so I had blogged for years and then I thought I, that more and more I was finding video content that I was interested in but that didn't mm -hmm. really mesh with a blog format so i wanted to figure out how i could in a sense blog about stuff i was finding in video format and so i was thinking about that and then jordan peterson came up and i was blogging about him but that didn't feel quite right and so i thought i'll make a video and see what happens i figured maybe 100 people would watch it and i'd gain two or three interesting conversation partners and that would be it, but that wasn't it. And everything else has happened since then. Yeah. Now, have you actually streamed with Peterson himself? Joined him on a stream? So someone early, so Jordan Peterson was giving half hour Patreon um, conversations and somebody gave me one of his. And so I had a half hour conversation with Jordan as a Patreon. Call. Oh, cool. And that was April of, of, of 2018. So that was right before the Jordan Peterson wave started growing. Yeah, I found him, you know, I did my first video about Peterson in November of 2017. And C16 was October of 2016. So he had been growing. And when I subscribed, he had about 300,000 uh, subs on his YouTube channel. Right. Now he's got what a million or something like that. A couple million. Oh, is it a couple million at this yeah, point? It's, it's now, over now, so you started doing a your your channel. It, it's not necessarily a Peterson channel, but it kind of sort of is. Uh, what? How would you describe your channel? It's it's you you have a lot of different wheels, like a lot of different irons in the fire with what yeah. you're trying to do with your channel. But my how would you describe it? My channel. My channel is kind of functions kind of how my blog used to function. My blog functioned as, so pastors, so when I was in seminary, really before the internet was anything, pastors would have file cabinets full of newspaper clippings. And this is how pastors would keep in touch with the culture, compile sermon illustrations, things like this. Oh, now, okay. when the internet came along very quickly, keeping files full of clippings didn't make much sense. So I was always looking for ways to archive information. Eventually I, I settled just on having a blog where I could find things, put links in and keep things. But then I also found that I used the blog as sort of a conversation partner where I could think out loud about things. And so I'd put disclaimers on my blog 
just because I post something doesn't mean I endorse it. You know, everything I read in my blog is there. It's just off the top of my head. I'm thinking out loud because I'm a pastor of a small church and who am I going to talk to? Uh, most of the people in the church aren't interested in a lot of the weird nerdy things I am. So my blog was a, a thinking partner and my YouTube channel really is the same thing. And except sometimes I have people like what you and I are doing right now where we're talking together. So we're thinking together, but my monologue videos, as I call them, or my commentary videos, I'm just thinking out loud. And so I was really surprised that anybody would care to watch what in many ways is just part of my- Well, you're kind of, you kind of got a perfect mix because you're a traditional pastor, but you're also obviously pretty well read or maybe even very well read. And, and you kind of write in the, write in a, the type of perfect wheelhouse for YouTube. And your channel is pretty good. You know, your channel, you, you, you put out a lot of content that's, that's usually like, you know, right in the wheelhouse of stuff that almost everybody that I know is interested in. You know what I mean? Um, touching on all the people who, who most people find irrelevant. Tom Holland, Jonathan Pajot, uh, John Verveke, Jordan Peterson. I thought you had a, a thing that was more dedicated towards Peterson. Do you have some sort of group? That's that's dedicated towards specifically towards him. Well, so when my channel took off, people in Sacramento started contacting me, and they they flowed into my church, but they kind of my church was kind of weird to them. So you know they said, well, why don't we start a meetup? And it's like, oh okay, um, what well, could you know? I, I figured I'd put I waste eighty bucks on Meetup.com, three people would show, and within three three months, it would be dead. Uh, right. That's not what happened. A dozen people showed the first time and almost always new people continue to come. And so we started doing meetups and I really, and what I discovered in the meetup was I had always wanted church to be sort of like a meetup. And in, in the book of, in the book of Corinthians in first Corinthians, Paul has, um, in the book of Acts, actually, it's described. But when Paul was in Corinth, he rented out this hall, the Hall of Tyrannus, and he would just sort of, you know, do lectures and stuff like that. And I would imagine Paul's talking, because if you read about him in the book of Acts, he's a Renaissance man, very well read, yeah, engaged totally, with totally. thinkers of his time. Right. And, and so I'd always been frustrated too, because people in church are... People in church don't tell the truth, at least not as the truth as they see it. And they're saying things that are doctrinally correct, even if they have doubts about it or don't believe it. They're, they're afraid of speaking the truth because they'll lose status. And right. what happened in the meetup was mostly atheists and people who don't go to church would come to the meetups and they would speak their mind. And that's really refreshing because it means you can actually have a meaningful conversation with people about, and, you know, eventually conversations would go towards religious topics or philosophical topics. We try to stay away, excuse me, from politics as that tends to be a dead end. But, and I was finding that at these meetups, we're just having great conversations together and I'm, th I'm thinking, this is what I've always wanted a church small group to be like. And there it was. Yeah, so you found your niche. Yeah, I totally agree with you. The, uh, I've, I've made the same observation. That's a lot of apologists do the same thing. They will tell you what they think they're supposed to believe or tell you what they think they're supposed to say. And church people do it all the time, as opposed to what they actually believe. Right. And what they actually really honest to God in their heart of hearts believe. Right. Um, so yes, I totally agree. Now, how would you, you've, you've, you've streamed with John, with uh, Verveke, correct? Yeah. John and I have had times? a number of conversations. And what, what do you think about his project? Have you watched any of his meaning crisis series? And oh yeah. I've watched them all. Okay, good. So yeah. So have I, I, I thought a number it, of times, um, a lot, uh, we, the people who I stream with, one of the guys is an atheist. The other guy, Nick, you know, there's another guy. Um, um, they, they, they seem to think, or at least one of them said that he's better than Jordan Peterson. Like it's in the same wheelhouse of, 
kind of a secular, I, I, how would you describe the wheelhouse this is for people who don't know these two? It's, you know, exploring spirituality and religion and things like that in secular terms and scientific terms. What would you say? Well, John is a cognitive scientist. And I think at heart, he is seeking truth, beauty, what the Hebrews would call shalom. Now he's in many ways, we would describe him as post-Christian. I think he's also post-Buddhist. And so in some ways, I see his, his project as, as similar to mine. Now, he's a university professor. And so instead of doing sermons like I do on Sunday, he does lectures. And, but, but I think he's, he's asking the deep questions about what does it mean to be a human being? What is truth? What, what matters? I see him asking those questions and, and pursuing that. And I respect that. Now, he, he isn't a Christian the way I am or Jonathan Peugeot, but he's, he's certainly a good faith conversation partner. And he, I think, has developed a lot of language which is potentially accessible. Now, his language is, is rather difficult, as, as Job, a friend of mine, Job says, fancy verveki words. His language fancy tends to be... For, yeah. His language you got to kind of know the dialogue. Yeah. It, it Agent tend, arena relationship. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. But it's, but it's, you know, it's, at least he's, in a sense, trying to do this out in a public space. And so part of the difficulty that, that Christians have is that to a certain degree, if the church is successful, its people will have been so colonized by Christian language and the language of their tradition that they mm -hmm. can live comfortably at home in it. Now, that's both a strength and a weakness. It's a strength because for them and their community, they have what they need to exist and survive and endure, but it's not terribly helpful for people outside the church, because Christians then all just just revert to their version of Christianese, yeah, and they totally. can't. I, have... I, I use the term Christianese a couple of times in my videos, and a couple of atheists noticed the word and and didn't quite get what I meant. You know, yeah. yes, Christianese is exactly what it is, where you start talking that God speak that alienates people who aren't in the fold. They don't really get what you're talking about, and it's not. You're not, if you're not saying it in secular terms, they might even be able to, I mean, part of what I do is try to translate everything I say into um, language that, that secular people can easily understand because a lot of the faith talk just doesn't translate, right. even though they might get the concept. Right. You know, that's kind of what John Verveke is about. He's exploring the concepts of religion or spirituality and, and, chiseling it into a more precise scientific exploration, I guess is how I would say it. I yeah, well, his, his project is even more ambitious than, ambitious than that. I mean, his project is audacious yes. in its scope. Um, I, I, it's, 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 it's far too large of a project for one individual or even one generation, but it is connected to my project because what the church has to do and actually has been remarkably successful in doing is in fact connecting diverse cultures and generations to Jesus Christ in the world. That is the job of the church. And I, you know, and so, you know, I look at what John is trying to do and it's like, wow, that's big. And so <laughs> that's, that's big. Yeah. And so, you know, more power to him. And John and I are, you know, we very much understand that we're, uh, we disagree on some foundational things, but the, I, I think it's helpful to bear witness to the fact that people can have good faith conversations um, across some of these lines. Now, I think Jordan's project was different. Okay, go ahead. Jordan, Jordan, I think saw himself as something of a prophet and a guru who was going to improve the lives of individuals in a very concrete and practical way 
to whatever degree his reach, um, you know, to whatever degree he could reach out to people. And I think he was unbelievably successful in that. But he wasn't attempting to construct for them an entire inhabitable order in the sense that John's project and, and especially some of his partners are, are attempting to pursue. So in that sense, Jordan's project and John's project are there, they've got some overlap, they're in some ways parallel, but immediately when I began listening to Jordan Peterson, I noted he, he was not really trying to build an institution. And by institution, I don't just mean a 501c3 or something with a name on it, but as, as John Verveke is, a set of practices, a community. I mean, that's what John's right, trying to John do. Right, John Verveke is trying to build a religion, religio, of right. without religion. Uh, yes. A, a yes. secular monastery type movement where he wants to build an actual you 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 don't believe in God. He's taken as a precept that God doesn't exist. I, I, his he seems to be an atheist, but he's very comfortable with spirituality. But you you replace all of the things that religion is giving you. You analyze what religion is actually given to people, and then you replace it all without God. That's yeah. He's kind of non-theistic, which is different from atheistic. And and so if you listen to his stuff, that's an important distinction. And, and, and that's, you know, that's not new to John. There's uh, Beyond Theism was a CBC radio program in Canada. You can still find it in podcast version. And, right. and so a lot of the things that John has been working on, many others have been working on similar things. Yeah, okay. Um, but that, that's the scope of what he's trying to do, right? Um, yes, he's, he's trying to take all those, those trends and, and formalize them, put them into an actual structure. Yes, and help people. So, so again, John is, John is a university professor, but in many ways, he's also, in a sense, I see John Peterson and myself have some similarities in that in some senses, we're all preachers. Now, now, John Verveke, more in a sense of he's a practitioner. So he just did a video on meditation and he's talking to Guy um, Sengstock about his circling practice. And he's in dialogue with the men's movement that rebel wisdom is really connected with. So, so in that sense, John is analogous to me in that he is a practitioner. He's a right. practitioner of sorts. Right, and you're you're a preacher in the traditional sense. You you're yes. trying to ultimately route this all back to the revelation of Jesus Christ, having more Jesus in your life, becoming more of a of a practicing Christian. The the similarity between you and these two guys tends to be the open mindedness. Um, you you you're more open minded in your approach than most theists would generally be. That's what I would see the similarity as. I don't know how you see the similarity. The people say that of me. I'm not quite sure what they mean. Because I, I, I just am, I just do things like I do, and people will often say, "Well, but for a pastor, you're different." And I think, oh, I, I know lots of pastors who are as open as I am, and still, and still committed to Christian orthodoxy. I, I haven't found. I know it's, that it's, there are, I get, I get what they mean. It's a compliment. I, it may yeah, sound I like know it's a compliment. I take it as such. Right. It's not it's not even a backhanded compliment, because no. if you take some of the public preachers, um, they're very automatic and knee jerk, like they would never deal with someone like John Verveke. They wouldn't get it. They wouldn't see how it's sympathetic to theism in, in, in a deep way because they wouldn't give it the time of day to actually understand that. You know, like one of the one of the guys in our group is an atheist and he said it's helped him become a lot less of an anti theist because he kind of starting to understand some of the mechanics of spirituality and religion and you know the science and things like that and how narrative is important thematically he's similar to jordan peterson they they latch on to some of the same ideas um but in terms of overall project and vision no i would say you're a traditional pastor who happens to be making use of the tools that you find available to yourself is that I'd kind of what you that's exactly right and <laughs> and and i just did a podcast with some friends in tucson where you know, I kept emphasizing people are like, well, 
you know, why do you do this? And it's like, I'm, I'm doing what pastors do. I'm just doing it on YouTube. Right. And, and now it's also significant, you know, if I had a church of thousands of people, if I was running some big evangelical parachurch organization, I probably couldn't do what I do. Right. Because, you know, I would say something wrong, you know, but at this point in my career, I, I, I pastor an unimportant church. We don't have a magazine. We barely have a website, you know? And so I, but, but I still, and so that's why I keep emphasizing to people, I am a pastor and what I am doing in front of you and inviting you to do with me is think out loud honestly. If you don't believe in God, whatever, however you conceptualize that, say so and tell me what you do believe in and let's talk about it. Because right. in my position, of course, I do believe in God. I do believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And so I'm not afraid of having conversations with people. I mean, I think Christians should be the most free to tell us, tell the world about our doubts, our beliefs, our suspicions, our fears, because finally, I am not saved by the rightness of my thinking or my capacity to fully implement my beliefs. I am saved by a God who sent his son to die for me. What, how much more secure can I be? So that's why I think that's why I can be open and free and share all of my messiness with the world. Or not Amen. all of it. All of it that's appropriate. Yeah. Ho hopefully not all of it. Don't, don't give us too much information. <laughs> but yeah, amen. Amen to what you just said. I'm totally, I'm totally down with that. Now, how do you see Jonathan Pajot? You kind of explained him to me and helped me understand him a little better. He's, he's kind of radical in his thought process, but he's also very orthodox in his practice is this is this true am i am i getting that right is that jonathan peugeot is is so conservative people can't recognize him as such okay so that's the radicalness it's like yes. a truly a truly committed conservative appears like he's like the edmund burke of nowadays he's totally <laughs> totally go ahead it, there on my channel there's a couple of conversations with a guy named um uh, Nathan Jacobs, who is making making movies, but he he actually got a PhD from Calvin Seminary, where I have my MDiv from. Um, right. Very interesting guy. But you don't what people don't understand about the Orthodox Church is that the point of the Orthodox Church is that they don't change. Yes, they don't change, and they're they're serious about it. And, and that's what people don't get. And so Jonathan Peugeot is an artist. And so he is trying to do art in continuity with the, the, with the unchanging nature of the church. And, but now he is also obviously conversant in philosophy because I mean, artists, are deeply philosophical if, if they're good artists. And so right. what Jonathan, he's, he's not only a good artist, he's are also articulate. And so what he's able to do is talk about these connections. And so, I mean, it's fascinating. It, it's, it's fascinating what has gone on around Jonathan Peugeot. And it, in fact, may be more fascinating and more important than what happened with Jordan Peterson or even John Verveke. I mean, it's it's incredible what what is happening around Peugeot. Why why more fascinating and important? Because in a sense, with Jonathan Peugeot, you have you have something like a church father who is conversant in English and our contemporary culture, and and so John, what John is trying to do is translate between like these the joker right the joker he'll do streams right. on santa claus the joker i forget i forget what, how many 50 different things that he'll he'll latch on to that's really like contemporary 
And then I guess you, what you're saying is go really deep um, in, a, in a philosophically pure, theologically pure way that uh, to the untrained person, we might not even recognize as theologically pure. I, I don't know if I would say pure. I would say, he might say pure. I would say old because a lot of it depends on, on whether or not, a lot of it, a lot of it depends on, on what progressive revelation means. Okay. <laughs> because in many ways, you know what happens if you if you want to understand the Protestant Church, the Protestant Church tries to modulate to. I mean, Christians are always trying to maintain a narrative thread. Every religion does. Right. So, so you have the scriptures. You have the the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus comes along and reinterprets the Hebrew scriptures in the light of that revelation, and that's what the New Testament is. Read right. a book like the book of Revelation, where I, I spent 75, I did spend 75 weeks with my Sunday school class on the book of Revelation. And my conclusion about what that book is, is basically an attempt to, to modulate the Old Testament, considering Jesus Christ, obviously in an um, apocalyptic format, apocalyptic genre. But that's what the New Testament is, and and what the what the Orthodox Church attempts to do is not lose that New Testament framework. But now there's a lot of discussion to the degree that to to what degree have other influences impacted the Orthodox Church. Now Protestantism, in a sense, just says, okay, we're all in the stream and we've got to swim together. So they modulate in different ways, um, but. So, I mean, and it's really hard for Americans to understand the Orthodox Church because it hasn't been here that long. It hasn't been in America that long. Right. It's it's the rock upon you, Peter, upon you, I build this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it's timeless. I, what, I, what I think you're describing is it's it's trying to be true, true, completely true to its sacred traditions. And these traditions are timeless and they don't change. And right. in some sense, that in some senses, that's even the comfort of the Roman Catholic Church. I don't know how you feel about Roman Catholicism. Well, they're but, they're parallel in that sense. But what's interesting between them is, of course, the Roman Catholic Church grows up in the West with Latin as their base language, and right. and the Orthodox Church grows in the East with Greek as its base language. But that then adds to the really the the deep question of Christianity, which is. Can religions work in translation? Jews say no. Muslims say no. Mormons, in a sense, almost say no. Not really because of their prophetic tradition. But Protestants say yes. And uh, it's, it's really complicated. But, and that's why, that's why, that's why Jonathan is, is such an interesting figure on the landscape because I, I don't think people fully appreciate what the movement around him means it's it's terribly interesting would you could you liken it when you're talking i, I keep thinking of like a, a really really like committed to the blues down south blues man who learns to play like georgia delta blues and it's totally in his soul and to like the modern world he strikes everyone as like the most radical like forward thinking progressive like you know avant-garde yep. artist but all he's doing is just pure digging into the tradition and totally embodying it right and purifying it. right but it's it's also important to recognize that he's someone who comes into the tradition as an adult and that's different from let's say someone who who grew up let's say in the orthodox church and then immigrates to america like i, I had a conversation with a guy in one of my sister churches who who grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church and then is going to this sister church of mine, a CRC church in one of our suburbs here. And that particular church is really trying to blend a lot of the tradition, as Protestants often do. But this person growing up in the Greek Orthodox Church really likes that because they're also trying to modulate 
the Greek heritage and faith that they grew up with, with, with now being a California suburban. So all of these different cultural things are, are in play. And so Jonathan being a, a French Canadian who spent some really formative time both in the university and in Africa, um, he's just got to be one of the more interesting people to me out there, partly because I'm also someone who, who is fascinated by culture. Was he in Africa? Was he doing missionary work? Yes, he was a missionary with the um, with um, uh, Mennonite Central Committee, I think. Did you do missionary work? Yes. For what? For the Probably. Christian Reformed World Missions. For a year or two, or no? For from I was I I I went there in ninety and I left in ninety seven. Oh wow! Where was there? That was Dominican Republic. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, what about the people who come to your Jordan Peterson meet and greets? I'm, I'm guessing that a, a chunk of them are atheists, correct? Yes. And what's, what, how, how do you, what do you see going on here with um, the Jordan Peterson phenomenon? Not, not necessarily his cult of personality part, but like how he's impacted the dialogue, let's say. Like the Sam Harris, let's, let's start with the Sam Harris debate. Did you watch those debates? I'm yes. assuming you did. Yes, and, a lot of commentary on them. Yeah. Um, so, what 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 are some what are some of your what are some of your pearls of wisdom from you having observed those debates? I I think. So so what happened with Charles Darwin was that Charles Darwin initiated a consensus of skepticism nested within the positivism of the nineteenth century. That sounds terribly philosophical. Uh, um, no, we can we can just clarify it for just for people listening. I, I'm pretty sure I get almost what you mean. That he, go ahead, go ahead. Well, he, you know, before Charles Darwin, Christians regularly were positing evolutionary ideas. With Darwin, the consensus emerged that you didn't need God as agent to initiate to initiate um, evolution and the development of the world as we know it, the physical right. world, okay? Now, this is important because part of what, when I saw Jordan Peterson, I was really, I was kind of continuing to work my way through C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles. And, right. and I was, and I listened to Jordan, and I was, I was wrestling with the fact that when I want to preach on the Old Testament or Genesis 1, the cosmology, which is not incidental to that world, has, you know, waters above and waters below, a firmament, which if people do any serious look, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, there's a firmament. It's like, what's a firmament? I don't use that word at all. Well, it's a right. bowl. Well, what do you mean a bowl? It's a bowl and there's waters above and waters below and the world is in between and the flood happens when the floodgates are open and the water comes in and God remembers Noah and he opens the bottom and drains it out. That's the picture of the world that the Hebrews had. And it was in, it was in coordination with the rest of the people in the ancient Near East. And that picture is obvious if you read a translation like the King James Version it's pretty obvious. If you read right. the NIV or contemporary translations, they sort of start fudging it. They say an expanse and it's like, yeah, you're fudging that expanding the bronze where the, where the word comes out of. So, so I was wrestling with the question, how do we talk about the Bible, which was written in one culture to people who so I would get invited by friends to do introductions to Christianity in university classes, uh, right. mostly secular people. And I would, I would ask them a story like, how many of you think the world is round, everyone? How many of you can demonstrate to me that the world is round? Oh, we saw that picture from the news. No, 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 no. You know, let's, let's imagine that that was a hoax. Tell me how you can demonstrate. Now, the Greeks could do it because there's a whole bunch of different ways, but none of these kids could. I'd say, well, why do you believe this when you can't demonstrate it? Well, they don't know how to answer that. So right. everybody in church science, believes- man, Science, man, science. Science. <laughs> believes we're on this globe traveling around the sun 
but then they're reading in their Bibles about, you know, the sun running its course and the floodgates of heaven. And so I'm wrestling with, well, how can we talk about this? How can we talk about these two things? And then Jordan Peterson comes along and I'm listening to him and I'm thinking, he's addressing this. He is, he is, he, he is addressing this. And then I begin to notice that people are, you know, he was, he was renting out that theater for the biblical series and he's charging 40 bucks a head and he's rambling for two plus hours. And if you're a minister, you get complaints if you go much beyond a half hour or so in some cases. Do you, and, you get emails like, you know, you were, I have to leave it short. And it's like, <laughs> why do all of these atheists have so much hunger for the Bible because of what Jordan Peterson is doing? I wanted to know that because I wanted to learn how to do it. I wanted to know why this was happening. So well, he kind of, how he does it is he kind of circumvents the details that would trip up the secular audience and just cuts right to the metaphorical truths, cuts the chase of like, you know, the philosophy and the, the psychology behind like, for example, the Garden of Eden, he just starts talking about in symbolic terms, which you can automatically do with, with an atheist who's, you know, who's, who wants to have a real conversation about the Bible. You can talk about metaphorical truths then you don't really have to care if they were literally Oh, you know, you can start talking about what's the symbolism of the Garden of Eden? What does the tree of knowledge of good and evil represent? That's how I think he did it. But let's, what do you think? Well, I, I think that's definitely part of it. Now, for a long time, people have been dealing with this question with, a, with what I call concordism. And so you have like the gap theory or days are longer, or all these kind of things that, that Christians were trying to somehow match an evolutionary account with the story that they have in the Bible. Jordan Peterson does a kind of concordism, but it wasn't quite like anything I had ever seen. One of the things that he benefited from was, was, was Jung, because yeah, big time. what Jung did was recognize that, and Jordan Peterson gets this deeply, we all live within stories. And again, and I didn't, I, you know, I didn't see this. I'd seen this before, but Verveke really was helpful with the language. We, in many ways, are stories. That's what we are. This physical body is one thing, but the story that is Paul Vanderclay is a different thing. And, and what Jung recognized is that the, the ancient religious stories are really vital for the stories that we are, and we inhabit these stories. And, you know, so if you read in Jung's autobiography, and this is, you know, one of my favorite stories of him. So he's a young man, he's a young doctor, and he goes to work in the nut house. Um, you know, no, no offense to anyone, but he goes to work in the in the Twitter. You know, they had Twitter back then. Yeah. What do you mean? He goes, <laughs> he to, goes work to work in, for Twitter. He goes to work in yeah, that's right. He goes to work in the insane asylum, and all of the senior doctors, he's just a young guy coming in there, and they all say, Well, don't bother talking to these people because they're all crazy. And Jung's like, Yeah, but. Isn't what are they that, saying? What are they trying to tell us, man? Isn't that why we're here? And so right. he doesn't, he, he blows off the directive that he's given. He starts talking to these people and he begins to recognize, oh, you know what? If we do some stink with some tinkering with the story that I am and the story that's out here, these people aren't as hopeless as the doctors imagine them to be and they can make progress. Right. Okay. So now, the thing that I think Jordan did, and I didn't recognize this until he was on stage talking to Sam Harris in the first Vancouver talk, when it becomes abundantly clear that when Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris use the word God, they mean two totally different things. Right. And so then I labeled them God number Sam one. Sam Harris means a fundamentalist version, you know, man in the sky, zap you if you touch your wiener that type of thing like right i mean he, me he means like the most like that's how i see it go ahead so so and and I, again i've been continuing to piece this together over the last year or so and and so verveke's agent arena relationship is really helpful here because in some ways god number one is the arena it's it's the story in which we inhabit, 
Okay. Right. And much of the world, that's why I've been hawking this book, or at least the idea in this book, much of the world is, has, has always asserted that that story is impersonal, that there's a meta divine realm out of which gods and other conscious agents emerge. Now, God number one is that arena. God number two is the agent. Now, in in from in the Old Testament, God is in fact both the arena and the agent. And I get into this in my recent conversations with Brett Sockold, who's a Roman Catholic theologian, and and he has some really helpful language in this because he says what happens, and a lot of this happened in like the 11th and 12th century in medieval theology is that God, and you see it come full flourishing in deism, that God becomes part of the system. And so when Sam Harris imagines fundamentally a immaterial world and God is like Zeus, every time you hear a celebrity atheist say, well, the Lord in the Bible is just like Zeus, that's they're, they're philosophically, historically, it's, it's a complete, they're completely wrong because that is not at all how the Bible imagines God to be. God is right. not like Zeus. Zeus emerges from, you know, from the void and Iranos. I mean, it, that's what Zeus is. And the Lord is a fundamentally, the Lord is in him, we live and move and have our being. He is the arena, but he's also an agent. And so Peterson is wrestling with he's wrestling with the ontology of that agency but he can but but now through darwin and even you know even in his darwinian type of knowledge he establishes no you can get to god number 1 you can get to an imminent god even through a darwinian system and i think that's the trigger that peterson flipped for people they began then to be able to connect with the Bible in a new way because he drew that line. And I don't know that Peterson saw that line. And I know that a lot of other people didn't see that line, but that line got drawn deep within their, the matrix of who they were. And okay. now suddenly Sam Harris's complaints seem far more childish. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what it put into stark relief that the, the complaints are kind of very, very basic level, like almost nitpicky complaints. Um, but two questions, yes. given what you just said, off of what you just said. So do you think he's helped to see atheists to see the Bible in kind of spiritual terms? Um, what do you mean and, by spiritual? Well, that's, that's, what, that's, that's, that's where we can get interesting because there are atheists now, there didn't used to be when I started this two and a half years ago, who will say to me, I'm spiritual. I'm definitely spirit. Like the guy I was in a debate with yesterday, uh, what was his name? Stephen Tiger starts talking about aspects of Jesus, things that Jesus taught. I couldn't believe he was saying this. Normally atheists don't say this stuff, that things that Jesus taught that he found very compelling. And he also described himself as spiritual. And his complaint was more theological, like the sin and salvation. It's complicated what his complaint was. But enabling the atheist to see it in terms, like if you talk about metaphorical truths, um, you're enabling him to, to grapple with some of the spiritual content of the Bible without necessarily having to sign on to, I now believe in man in the sky, you know, theism as the fundamentalist says, something like that. I didn't say it very well, but maybe you know what I mean. I, I think what Peterson did was to give the Bible credibility. And one yes. of the things that you, what Jordan laid out was a Darwinian justification for for the validity of the Bible, but but not exactly in the same way. See, part of the problem with Christians today, and again, this is why Peugeot is so interesting. Part of the problem with Christians today is that they can only think about the Bible in a dualistic sense of what they understand to be natural and supernatural. And and that dualism gets problematic. And, and so what Peterson allowed was that, and, and actually uh, Rationality Rules did a video on Peterson, because he still keeps harping on Peterson, which fascinates me. Yeah, and then he does there was a lot. another guy, I think the guy's name is 
Destiny or something like that. I, I, I Destiny, it was, Destiny, or, I don't know. Or I don't know, but but it was a video that I, I did a little commentary on it too. But but he, I think he said it exactly perfect. He says, Jordan Peterson doesn't Jesus smuggle. He goes all the way up to the edge and stops. And I thought that's exactly right. He get all the way up to the edge and everybody's like, oh yeah, I'll just take the next step. And they do. And right. Do, do you think it was helpful that Jordan Peterson isn't quite a Christian? He's almost a kind of sort of Christian. Yes. Do you think that kind of helped that, that whole process? Yes. Okay. Why? I do too, but I, because he, because the way the Christian, non Christian, conflictive conversations have been laid out, once you say you believe things like the virgin birth or the resurrection of Jesus, you lose credibility. And so the strange concordism that Jordan has done, which isn't unique to him by any means, you no, can it's find. Not at all. You can find many, so let's call them, you can find many people have said very similar things, but but by Jordan, in a sense, staying on that end of the line, people like Adam Friended and others in this space um, are much more comfortable with him. But the day he, you know. The day he the day starts he, going, hallelujah, Jesus rose from the dead. They'll be like, eh, eh. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm actually, I'm friends with Friended. He's a friend of the channel. He's been on. He's been on the channel a couple of times, but I noticed that even in my videos. So sometimes go, you used a lot of scripture in that video. <laughs> you no, know, he, said Adam is so annoyed with me because I don't. So, so he says the thing about what makes Jordan so good is he goes right up to that line, but never over it. And it's like, yeah, but I live on the other side of the line, you know? Right. And, but what, what Jordan had done, which was so powerful was he constructed all of this on the side of the line that Adam is comfortable with. Right. And that's, but that's very, very, very useful because yeah. he never crossed that line. Right. And are you kind of seeing it in apologetics terms, in terms of like useful for, for you and I, in terms of presenting the gospel? Yeah. Because it's, it's I helping to true. stir up the intellectual, the intellect, it's, it's helping people not write off huge conversations about the Bible because they don't believe in, you know, the faith claims. Right. I agree. But I also think Jordan has made, Jordan has surely helped me think in some ways I never would have been able to think in before. As has John Verveke, as has Jonathan Peugeot. All three have colonized me pretty good in this, in this so uh, journey. So what do you mean? I wouldn't, so how, how so? How would you say that? Well, I, I don't think I fully appreciated the historical argument for what I would say Christians call inspiration, that on, on in terms of the merits of the Bible, uh, there's been no other book in all of human history that comes anywhere close to its significance for world history. Yeah. I mean, and that's a claim that you don't need any woo to make. Yeah, inarguably. Yeah, it's just a fact. It's a historical right. fact. And Tom Holland, you know, the stuff he's been doing, you know, that's been fascinating me lately. Um, you know, so there's there's a lot of plausibility that Jordan has brought to the table. And I think also John Verveke's project, you're, you're hard pressed if you, I mean, I think John Verveke, even though he's a non-theist, I think he just completely dismantles Sam Harris and these celebrity atheists because oh, he totally does. He, he just he, he just he, he just shows that they don't have any credibility scientifically. Right. It, yeah. Well, that's what none. that's what my friend meant. The the atheist guy. I I didn't think that was a small thing that he said he is he he's not an anti theist anymore because of his having grappled with with um, John Verveke because John Verveke taught him the neuroscience of how some of this is applicable, things like flow state, all that, you know, the actual complex neuroscience. Yeah, it's light years ahead of people like Sam Harris and yeah. light years. Yeah. It's first of all, it's not knee jerk. Yeah. It's not it's not reactionary. No. I hate religion. So let me write a book based on how I hate religion. And let me, you know, gather all the evidence according to according to my precept. You know, the, basically what what they complain about, they do. You know, his is a really deep dive into the mechanics of spirituality 
with a completely open mind. Yeah. So, and, and he's also just such a fair conversation partner. I mean, he uh, being from New Jersey, I think sometimes he could he could he could be a little nastier because it, you know if you come from New Jersey or from New York, unless someone's yeah, a little nasty, it. you don't forget quite about trust them. <laughs> I said that I said that to my wife when we first moved out here to LA because like. I think we went to a fast food place and somebody smiled at us and we're like, God, this is so strange. Like if somebody comes up to you in the street in New York and smiling, you're like, oh, you're like okay. Do I still what's have my wallet? You know? yeah. <laughs> okay, what's this guy want? What, what, okay, what do you, what do you want? <laughs> you're immediately like, you don't so trust John, him at all. So John, you know, John and the people around him are, are just jewels. They're, they're um, you know, again, having here's someone you can have a good faith conversation with and and he's going to be generous he's going to be fair and i've you know i've just deeply appreciated john's um you know john's openness and his availability to me and so it's it's been wonderful and i we're supposed to do a conference in september where john verveke and myself and jonathan peugeot uh, go to uh thunder bay ontario and I, you know, who knows what's going to happen in September with all of the virus. Oh, stuff. yeah, yeah. I forgot about it. But I that. really hope that that happens because I've never, I've not met either of them in person. And the, the focus of the conference is really to just give the three of us a chance to get to know each other and to talk together and to, um, to engage together. So I'm, I'm so excited and so looking forward to that. Now, do you hunger, um, do you think that these people are going to become Christian? Given that they're open-minded and they're approaching this thing in an honest fashion, oh, like you and I, obviously, is. yeah. Um, but I'm talking about Verveke and Peterson because I know uh, you're you're also friends with Esther, or she's been on your yeah. channel a few times. Oh yeah, yeah. Because she seems to hunger for Jordan. I got the idea that she was hungering for him to become an actual Christian, like kind of like he needs to fulfill that. Um, I, I, I don't think, know. I you think in this space. So, so this is where my Calvinism comes into play because I think in this space, I think we have to be careful about expressing our intentions for others. And where on one hand, I do consider myself a missionary. And if Jordan or John became Christians, that would obviously delight me. But there's, there's, a, certain, um, there's a certain amount of I, I I see you're I think it's finally the hesitant. Holy Spirit that that right. that changes people, not me. And so I I am going to, you know, Jesus, Jesus never said, you know, love only the Christians. Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor all the way up to and including your enemies. And so yeah. it's Christians, I think, in our context, have to be careful with our our tribal um, scalp numbering. And, and I think because a lot of people feel, you know, <laughs> hi, I'm Jesus and I have a horrible plan for your life. A lot of people feel that, that Christians are just playing a tribal game. And, well, yeah, well, and once, once if, they, if people, I mean, you're more like me. Um, first of all, Paul said, I become like everybody else so that I might win some. He didn't say, uh, and to plant seeds. So the sum total of your Christian witness should be interacting, you know, honestly with people and planting a seed here or there. It shouldn't actually be a witness, so to speak, that they actually feel manipulated or you've done something. So you're kind of like me in that, you know, you play, you, you, you put that, uh, I don't even know how I would say it, but um, no, I totally, I totally and hundred percent know what you mean. Once you, once you start smuggling Jesus in and you and someone goes, wait, he's smuggling Jesus. And then you're suspect from that point forward. What well, once I have an agenda for your life that you that 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 you feel is unfair or inappropriate, I have lost a degree of credibility because right. now you I'm just credibility. a con man. Right. And, then, and I then, think that's well then you it's your suspect, and everything yeah. you're saying is you're not having an actual conversation with me. You're just trying to route me, route me back to your, to your God or whatever. So, so my ability just... to love someone is not dependent upon them becoming a Christian in, in, a, in a formal sense. Okay. Interesting. Um, 
Do you, uh, on this tub subject, uh, a weird question on this subject, do you, I think you did a stream on those biscuit guys who deconverted. Yeah, I've been talking about them. Oh yeah, what's, okay, I didn't watch your stream on it. You, you stream, you put out a lot of content. <laughs> <laughs> I, I watch about an hour of your videos a week. That's about what I have time for. I think you put out like six, you know. I mean, it's great. I just don't have time to go, go through all of it. I, but, um, I, don't, I wouldn't have time to watch all of my videos. Um, I, watch, I, I watched your whole Tom, Tom Holland one and I, 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 watch, I watched some of them I watch in full, but um, so I didn't get your biscuits one though. So what was your take on the biscuits guys? Well, I, I, you know, sometimes people, sometimes people in the comment will complain because, you know, I'll grab onto someone like Jordan Peterson or John Verveke or Tom Holland or, or Rhett and Link, and I'll keep using them. I'll keep talking about them. The reason I do is because I'm a pastor and, and these people are illustrations of far broader things going on. And I have watched, um, I have watched my whole life people walking away from the faith and saying very similar things to Rhett and Link. Yeah, that's exactly now, what I got when I, I watched some of it. And I, I yeah. got frustrated because it was so dense to me. It was like, oh my God, they don't realize how, how the, the, to them, this is like brilliant and revelatory. And to me, it's like, oh my God, you're kidding. That's, go ahead. I'll well, let you well, talk. well, and so I want to talk about this, but it's sort of like talking about the virus now. You need a way to help people see it. And so people like Rhett and Link are illustrations. They show the dynamic right there. And so because they put out stuff on YouTube, they're available to talk about. So as a pastor, that's why, you know, when I started, I, pastors are always reading magazines and newspapers. They're always looking for illustrations because you can't talk about movements in, let's say, the zeitgeist if you don't look at actual people who right. exemplify what you're talking about. So they've right. so been a good introduction a to reason. post. It's a, useful, it's a useful tool for you to illustrate some of your key points about for the deconversion or why they do. So what do you think happened with them? Well, or give me, some, give me some of your insights. What, what, what were some of the things that you, you got from that? I think their deconstruction is... I think that, so I've been reading, I should probably get a copy of the physical book too. I've been reading uh, Ross Douthat's book, The Decadent Society. Oh, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I always think, thought it was Dutat. That's the, that's yeah, the, I know. Nobody knows York, how to say the dude's name. New York I, Times I, writer, right? He used to be an editorialist for New York Times. Douthat. I, I've, people, people in the comments section have been schooling me on how to say his name. I've been Douthat. calling him Dutat my whole life. I yeah. never, never know if... <laughs> Never, never sure if it was right. It's just the only thing that made sense. So, so I think part of, I think the deconstruction that we're seeing is a natural part of the process by which the church continues to refine and purify and engage the culture around because they Amen. are, they are symbols of where the church has of, of how the church needs to continue to get up to speed. But now people are going to hear that in a lot of different ways. Um, and, and for me as a pastor, that puts them front and center because for these two guys who make YouTube videos, I know many, many more people who are not thinking exactly like them, but there's enough commonality that the same thing is going through the system. And so well, I watched, of... I watched a little bit of the, one of these atheists, Pine Creek, Doug, I watched a little bit of his about 20 minutes of him. And it seemed to be, they almost were right on his page. Like he, he almost from the part I watched, he seemed that everything he, he, that one of them was saying, he was like, yes, yes, that's totally. So yeah, the thing that happened to them is totally common. Yeah. And it's standard issue as far as I'm concerned. Go ahead. Well, I'm and, sorry, and part you. of the thing that we have to think about is, so this is, a, this is a point I continue to make often because people don't appreciate it. Church attendance reached its peak in the United States during the Cold War, okay? Okay. For many of us, so I was born in 63. For many of us, our experience of, 
the way Christianity works in our society is built on that framework, on those assumptions. Now, during the Cold War, Christians were considered maybe uptight, maybe prudish or priggish, but their morality was pretty much in alignment with the general morality and the culture. Right. That began to change in the counterculture. And that shift is fundamental. So now we're to the point where Sam Harris can't believe the Bible because the Bible is immoral. That didn't happen in the same way in the 1950s. People looking back at the 1950s, but, but that change in orientation is fundamental. So it's, so profound. Part, it's profound. That's a really good observation. Go ahead. Well, and, and Christians have to appreciate that in terms of, in, so, so if you look at, let's say, youth ministry from the 60s on, so Rhett and Link are also poster child children of that, as what they were telling basically in youth group was, you can be Christian and still be, be cool. I mean, that's what youth groups have been doing forever. You can be a Christian and still be cool. And they were responding to the Cold War alignment where Christians are basically just more moral or more uptight. So you can knock on people's doors using evangelism explosion and say, if you were to die tonight, what would you say to, to God to let you into his heaven? That line pushed by D. James Kennedy and evangelism explosion makes zero sense in many of the communities in which we live in today. Still works in some, but not in others. Right, and because so, there's almost none of that 1950s square peg, black and white, you know, father knows best morality. I wasn't raised on that at all. I mean, that was the furthest thing from what I was raised from. And, and just being like raised as, you know, a secular modern person, you start to crave some of that somewhere along the way, or at least the, there's part of it that represents stability, sanity, peace of mind and order. Um, right. I, start, I found myself in my 20s starting not necessarily craving the square peg aspect of it, but craving the, you know, see, the, the stability, the, the peace of mind, the orderliness. Like you, you, there comes a time where it's just, you know, staying out till five in the morning at the rock and roll party starts to get too much and starts to scare you. Because you're like, wait a minute, I, you know, I'm, I'm losing something fundamental. Go ahead. That's right. Sorry. No, that's off. exactly right. And that's the process that's going on now. Look at marriage, for example. I mean, who, who's going to be married 20 years from now? The religious and the wealthy. The wealthy because they want to keep their money and the religious because they, they believe right. it pleases yeah. God. And they're going to hang in. They're going to hang in there in their marriages. Right, but the thing about it though, is that hanging in there is the right thing to do. I mean, that's where it gets really painful. I, that's where I'm somewhat empathetic to the social conservatives. Because like, for example, my wife and I, I told this story on another stream, where when she worked at the, the real estate place down the street in Malibu, we were the only ones, 50 people in that, that office, 70 people, the only ones on our first marriage. Everybody yeah. else had been married two, three times. Yeah, 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 I know, only I know. Once. I grew up in New Jersey. You know, I lived in Michigan and the Dominican Republic, but most of my, most of my adult life, I've lived in California. It's the same thing. Yeah. And, and so, and, and it doesn't mean that, you know, you will not get me to say marriage is easy. I know it. But how can I stay married to someone for 32 years? Well, you know what? It's hard. Well, why do you do it? Well, you, you begin to appreciate because it's right. <laughs> you do it because it's right. There's not enough of that. Like, and your children will bless people. you for it. Right. If you do it right. And, and this is what, I mean, and you, you, we begin to see this, you know, if you bump into people who let's say were raised by hippies, you know, some of the biggest control freaks I know were raised by hippies. Why? Because gosh, you know, they, they start to crave it. That's right. They, they needed stability. Please give me order. You let know, me, why let me, let me illustrate your point. My nephew, who gets along with my wife really, really well, is now stationed in Hawaii as a Marine. And part of the reason why he opted for that, and he's Mr. Like, you know, he's a really good kid. His family, his, my brother-in-law and his sister, you know, 
rich hippies, guys, a, a record producer and, you know, millionaires, but total, total hippie, you know, Birkenstocks. She doesn't like Starbucks because it's too corporate, like those type of hippies. <laughs> like, like, oh my God, like, I love them, but like, to the point where you're like, oh, good gosh, you know, and he becomes the exact opposite because you crave it, yeah. you know? Well, they and, homeschooled and, and him the, for like the, hippie homeschool. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, people have, people have gotten so naive. So I watch couples who decide this, this is just no longer working for us anymore. We're going to go our separate ways. Everything will be fine. And then, then they look at their kids and their kids are, you know, giving all of these signals that, that the kids are not okay with this. Yeah. And yeah. people are like, they're surprised. It's like, why would you be surprised? Do you not know what a child is? You know, and, and you know, self, self-actualizers are so often just simply selfish. And what do we want from our neighbors and our spouses and the people that we rely upon? We want them to be truthful. We want them to be sacrificial for our welfare. And Christianity totally. has at the center of its faith a guy who dies for people who are mocking him and spitting him, spitting on him and crucifying him. That's totally. at the center of our faith and Christian. But the say, true message of Christianity, master. though, is that that's ultimately what is going to fulfill you. You just don't get it yet. Do you, yeah, if you well, lay down your life for my sake, you will find it. That's the actual promise of Christianity, that if you start living that way and cultivate selfless love, that's where you actually truly find yourself. Yeah. The, the way the world tells you to live ultimately leads to your ruin. Yeah. And just one note on the, on the divorce, then I'll let you talk. My mom, when I was a kid, I thought my parents had the happiest marriage. It was such a revelation to me when I was like 19, 20, and I started realizing that it wasn't a happy marriage at all. Like I used to tell my, my, my sister and I, my sister was like, you were really dumb about it. You know, like one time my mom told me some of the reasons why she never got divorced, but a lot of it was because they were raised Roman Catholic. And I had enough of a, of a dark period in my life where I almost, almost left. Yeah. You know, I can't promise you that I could have been able to handle that if they had gotten divorced when I was in high school. Yeah. That would have killed me. That would have honestly got killed. I was enough of a troubled, drug-addled, angry young man without that. I don't think I would have made it if they had. Yeah. I really don't. But, you know. Well, and, and you know, I think your, your story illustrates another fact, which is we all think in the time spans of our little individual lives, like in decades, the kind of issues we're talking about move in decades. And so... Right. You know, what your parents were raised with, whether or not they kept going to church, still deeply formed them. Totally. And so the, you know, the the blessings of of people two, three generations back are bestowed upon people who don't know them personally. Totally. And and we don't understand this about human beings, but it's it's true. And and you know, by the grace of God, people who start their lives living at, as a train wreck can, in pretty short order, find, you know, but what do we call that? We call that conversion. We say, I am a new person. You know, that's what we, that's what we call it in Christian language. They are a different person. And how can someone change that quickly? Well, in Christian terms, we say, well, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, what does that mean? It means that someone else has taken possession of your heart and your goals and your life. And you are now, you now have a new identity and you're a new person. And, and that happens by accident to some people and other people, they try for it. So happens by, happened by accident to me. I wasn't, I wasn't looking to become a Christian when I moved out to California, you know, at all. Yeah. yeah. At all. So yeah, totally, totally. I mean, Yeah. Um, and and actually the thing you said i think is is a lot more profound than people realize that that my mother and my father had deeply my mom was in the process of being like a you know a, a feminist deconverter in, in in the 70s too she never became an atheist because there was no such thing as like mass atheism like if she had turned on the tonight show with johnny carson and there'd be someone like sam harris she probably would have been like yeah i'm cool with that because she had some of the same things she was raised deeply devoutly catholic and she was having some of the same issues. Like she was very anti-clerical, 
very anti-church stance on this politics or that politics, but still deeply Catholic. And same thing with my father. And that's a lot of the reason why they never even contemplated divorce because they were deeply Catholic. My dad still went to church all through the seventies and eighties, nineties, you know. And, and there's some very interesting studies on if, if one parent, if one parent is religious and the other one isn't in many ways, it's not always the case, but in many ways, if the father maintains the father's faith, that impacts the children differently than if the mother maintains her faith. Those are very interesting dynamics. We don't exactly understand them, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, no doubt. And that's part of what I think people like Brett Weinstein are recognizing, that you know, the, the 50 square peg morality got trashed in the 60s and the 70s in some ways, justifiably so. There was yeah. there's some aspects that are criticized now, automatically. That I, you know, the criticism valid. There it didn't include people of color. Didn't include tolerance for people who were different than the, the the social norm. I get that. You know, that's valid criticism. But there was some sort of stability and sacredness and order there that you know I think we desperately need yeah. to some degree. Yeah. 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 No. And so you know, when, when you look at rat, I mean, Christians can be really nasty to, to people like Rhett and Link and call them traitors, but I think Christians should thank them for airing their views because once it's out there on the table, well, now we can talk about it. Right. Now we can talk about it. So let's talk about that. And let's talk about it, not in a way that I'm going to crowd you or I'm going to intimidate you. Partly, it's easier for us now because in many communities in the United States, like in California, there Christians have no political power and we have no relational pressure. And you hear all these oh, Christians were using all of their pressure to intimidate. It's like, I haven't seen a pastor yeah. that's intimidating for years. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just, a, yeah, that's what I, when I, I had Drew, the genetically modified skeptic, <laughs> he was one of the people I interviewed at the one of my first videos. And I was telling him, he, he got it. He was raised in Bible Belt. He was raised in Texas, yeah. in Christian town, all family Christian. But I told him in my town, in Westchester, that I didn't know an evangelical Christian. And that is the one thing it wasn't kosher to become. Yeah. Like if people found out that I'd become a Christian, they would have been like, ew, really? You know, you can become a Jehovah, you can become anything. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, that's cool, man. You know, God that he's found something that keeps him going, you know? But you become a Christian and, every, and someone didn't believe it. They were in the comment section going, where does where does he live? I don't buy it, you know. Well, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. And, you know, in Patterson, Similar. there's everything there, you know. So I was I was CRC and it's Christian Reformed Church, Dutch Calvinist. And it's like, yeah, there's some Dutchmen around. You can find them. The Jews are in in Fair Lawn. The, the, the Italians are in, you know, Totowa and... And hailed in. I mean, it's just New Jersey's all these little ghettos of, of enclaves. And then the Puerto Ricans came. And then after I left, the everybody called me Arabs. I don't even know where they came from. The Dominicans came. I mean, that's just the New York area. When did you leave New York? Did you you were, you grew up there till when? Till eighty one. Eighty one. So so did you have? Did you go to the city a lot? Do you like New York City? Yeah, I like New York City. I, I didn't go that much. Um, my father loved my father loved the city, so we'd go. You know, you go to Radio City Music Hall and and watch the Easter show and see the circus. And so Patterson's only you know, I could see the I could see the New York skyline from my bedroom window. Yeah, Hastings is twenty minutes outside by train. Oh, okay, yeah. And both both my sisters live in Manhattan now, so. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, I went there. I, I so I I left in eighty one, and. I hadn't been I hadn't been to New York in years and then I got a chance to go in 2006 because I had a little pastor's clutch with with Tim Keller and I went there in 2006 and it was like what happened to this city you know because I left in the old A beam days and Ed Koch and you go taxi to New York drive. we're a taxi driver with yeah then you go to New York City and it's like where'd all the yeah. white people come from <laughs> Yeah, and, 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 and it's also clean. What happened? 
Yeah, <laughs> Times Square turned into Disneyland. It did. I remember- when I was in high school, the Christian school kids would sneak out to New York City to try and, you know, get in the peep shows and stuff. And now it's like Disney took over Times Square. Yeah, it's totally. and And gentrified. It's really strange. I remember yeah. in like 81, I was walking with my friend on like 43rd Street and he goes, did you know that this particular street is the most dangerous city block in the entire world? <laughs> <laughs> and you would get harassed every time you were there. Someone would, someone would come up to you and be like, smoke, 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 smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when I went in 2006, it's like, yuppies took over this city. What, you know? It, it looks like it looks like Seinfeld or Friends or something. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, totally. So you live in Southern California? Yes. Live in oh, Miami. okay. Yeah, we moved here from New York. I met my wife in Purchase. We were in acting class together. She, oh, okay. she, it was her idea to move out here. She'd been flying back and forth, and uh, she talked me into it. And I wasn't a Christian then. I didn't become a Christian until the first year after we moved here. There was a little church down the way called the Malibu Vineyard. And I joined oh, that. Vineyard, yeah. Well, Vineyard, I mean, I, you, 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 you know, Vineyard is Wimber. Vineyard's basically charismatic Presbyterians. I guess. I, I don't really have that, that good of an insider knowledge of what constitutes what in terms of, I guess I just call myself non-denominational. Because if you say other things, people people get all these like, oh, you're one of those. And you're like, well, I guess I'm one of those. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> Am I? <laughs> so I don't, you well, know, I don't even know really. It wasn't until very recently that I had any idea of what actually constituted a Calvinist. You know, it wasn't until I got on, wasn't until I got on Twitter. A lot of this stuff was new to me. You know, all the, the whole subculture of Christianity. When you grow up in in like, just the normal suburbs where I wasn't actually religious at all growing up. You know, I, you don't pay attention to it. I barely knew who most of these people were, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, back now I know some of the names, but I have friends who like, I'll say Joel Osteen, he'll go, who, who's that? Like, you don't know who Joel Osteen is? And this guy's a really well-educated, like he knows every Russian yeah. author. He's read all the books of like, you know, Pushkin and Tolstoy and doesn't know who Joel Osteen is. It's just, there's a disconnect. In, yep, the, yep. in the in the regular culture at large that yep. didn't used to be in like the 50s and early 60s. It's taken hold from, probably from the culture, you know, what you were talking about, the cultural revolution. I'm a child of the 60s, you know, 69, I was born and I was one of the people in that wave of, you know, parents or boomers, basically. Okay, yeah, see my parents, my parents were born in the 30s, so. They were born before the war and just at well, the end so, yeah, of the so depression. Was yeah. So was mine. My, my, but they, they were, I was born in 69. I was the youngest. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So your family's very much my, my younger, so I was born in 63. My sister, who's the youngest in the family, she was born in 64. So you wouldn't have yeah, been same idea, behind me. Same idea. My mother, my mother was an uh, Italian immigrant in the thirties oh, okay. in Charleston. Okay. And my father was from the Midwest, same I roughly same time periods. They were in college in the 50s. See, my father, my father moved to New Jersey to turn what had been kind of a mission station to African Americans in Patterson to kind of turn it into a church. And so he spent uh, 36 years pastoring that church. So that's that's the context that I grew up in. But the Christian Reformed Church has a strong tradition of Christian day schools. So I lived in a black community and I uh, went to school with a lot of Dutch Calvinists. And so I always I I've always had a fascination with culture because I was always in the middle of all these different cultures. And as a kid, you don't know it. It's just what you know. And of course, Patterson in the New York area, it's just a every conceivable culture around and everybody trying yeah, to understand totally. each other totally so but you so you were actually raised in a long line of christian tradition i mean when people yes. respond to you as they're somewhat surprised that you're as free thinking as you are that makes complete sense to me because most people who are raised within a tradition like i know a lot of people out here who are who are christian who i didn't know christians before and it's hard for them to be free thinkers. Is there a, a free thinking strand in your particular breed of Calvinism, perhaps? 
you know, how some, some Protestants are more eggheady than others. And is that, is that potentially part of it? Yeah. My, so my father was, was sort of on the left wing of the CRC, but you got to understand that's a conservative denomination. And so there was a, in the, so after the second world war, there were a number of intellectuals in the Christian Reformed Church that that really did not want to be so insular anymore. So Alvin Plantinga, you might have heard his name. Yeah, yeah um, totally. Alvin Plantinga comes out of that movement. Nick Waltersdorf, Richard Mao, Richard Marsden. So these guys, um, Henry Staub, th these guys were were all Christian intellectuals post who had fought in the Second World War. Um, uh, Planting is a little younger, um, and they and they were they were it was sort of trying to embody the worldview of a Dutch uh, thinker polymath in the Netherlands in the 19th century named Abram Kuyper, who actually became the prime minister of the Netherlands at one point. He was a theologian, and Kuyper had a very interesting story. He was raised sort of in 19th century liberalism. But then as sort of a starter church, went out to a, um, a, a church out in the, the Dutch countryside and, and became, it, it's sort of a response to, see, neo or it sort of functioned as neo-Orthodoxy, but a generation before. And so this side of my tradition for a long time has been trying to figure out how we can be serious about the Bible and also serious about general revelation and keep those things together. And, but at the same time within a denomination that is not going to let you get away with being fast and loose with the Bible. And that's a really good discipline. Right, so, I got gotcha. you. So we, we have to read contemporary philosophers and science and all of those things if we're going to be honest about the book of general revelation but we also are not going to play fast and loose with the Bible. And so right. that's, that's the part of the Dutch Reformed tradition that I was raised in. And, and in some ways, that's, that's analogous to you know, some of what happened in, let's say, the Christianity Today side of evangelicalism. So, so yeah, the, the, most prominent, the most prominent philosopher that you might recognize would be Alvin Plantinga. And Pla Alvin, so Alvin's younger brother, Neil, Alvin Plantinga's father taught psychology at Calvin College, was my mother's psychology professor. Um, I never had a chance to teach, to get a class with Alvin Plantinga. I was able to catch Richard Mao and um, Waltersdorf and Richard Marsden. So there are, and there are others, uh, Luce Meads went on to teach at Fuller, but there's this element of Calvin College and the Christian Reformed Church. One person in Australia, even when I got there, this woman, she was working in the Anglican Church there, and she had said, oh, Dutch last name, talking about, you know, philosophy and its relevance to the modern world. Of course, he's from Calvin College. So this is the kind of stuff that that excuse me one sec. Excuse me one sec, Paul. Yep. I gotta, I gotta get a phone. Hold on. All right, that's my cue, I guess. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> he got a bigger name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. He's always dropping whatever's in front of him. Hey, right, do well, I, have, I don't have a, yeah. I don't have a video to post tomorrow. Can I download this and post this on my channel tomorrow? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, I'll do that. Do you want us to send it to you, or uh, I guess you can probably just download I'll it. I'll just directly. download it and, yeah, yeah. and post it. No, this is this has been a, this has been a great conversation. Yeah, definitely for sure. All right, so while he's taking uh, phone calls, uh, I've got some questions for you from the chat as well. Okay. So let's see. Oh, uh, there's a uh, one from uh, Brett uh, that he he's part of our uh, weekly discussions on John Verbeke's uh, videos. And he and he's a non-theist. He he's curious if you think that Verveke's work and like especially his religion that's not a religion will be able to uh, uh, sort of work as some sort of bridge process be, between both the the theists and the non-theists in sort of moving forward. Like, do you think there's any, I guess, hope for his project there? 
depends what kind of bridge you're talking about. In terms of I mean, it's, it's very much been a bridge to me in terms of helping me better understand where, where many post, where cognitive science is coming from, where a lot of non-theists are coming from. I've been better to understand it, but I don't know if, so the thing is, once you're in a church, you're kind of in a church. Will his ideas impact people in church? Well, they've impacted me, so probably. A lot depends, I think. A lot depends on, on what kind of splash it finally has. I mean, part right. of the big weakness of the Jordan-Peterson moment was that Jordan, unlike, let's say, someone like Billy Graham, who was always thinking institutionally, Jordan was thinking like a clinical psychologist who is now working on a mass scale. John, I think, thinks quite a bit more institutionally, but the scope of his um, the scope of his project is so immense, it's hard to know how much one person can get done in their lifetime. And that, that I don't say that to say take anything away from John's work. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's really difficult to form communities that deeply impact people for generations to come apart from a well-established tradition. That's right. really difficult. Yeah, and, and at least for myself, just because like we've been having the, these conversations regularly, and, and myself, I, I'm a Christian. Craig's a Christian. Um, and at least it's sort of providing this bit of language that can be almost used uh, even outside of the, the like religious context, like still almost like a meta language to sort of speak be between faiths that I think could be very useful, even if it's not something like maybe it, it is the case that like Vervakis won't be able to create a full-on religion in itself but maybe some sort of like <laughs> uh i don't know like inner operating system or something yeah yeah be between between religions that could still be quite well useful. someone who was trying to convince us it's a sex it's going to be a sex cult that was <laughs> 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 No, I didn't say a good one. I didn't say a good one. I just said one. I didn't say like an enjoyable one. I'm, I'm back, by the way. I got I, I got called up and kicked out of the apartment. I'm now in the car in front of my apartment. My wife's like, I'm coming home. You got to get out of the apartment. So now. I, I think, you know, it's when you look at what, when you look at what finally moves and shapes history, there's so few individuals that do, but yet even the contributions of people whose names are not remember remembered are significant. And so, you know, it's it's impossible for us to know at this point in time what work will be important. You know, C.S. Lewis, by the end of the 1940s, everyone had believed C.S. Lewis's career had peaked and his influence had peaked. He was he was done at the end of the yeah. 40s. And C.S. Lewis is bigger today than he ever was when he was alive. Yeah. So we, we never know what influence we'll have going forward. So I, I just think it's tremendously difficult to, to not build upon a tradition that is fully there in terms of the language, the institutions, the tribal identities, that's it's just very difficult to start something fresh and, right. and i don't i wouldn't say john is trying to do that completely out of whole cloth i mean lately especially i'm looking forward to his series on on socrates because then he's able to sort of take you know if you're talking socrates now suddenly there's an audience and so you mm -hmm. build from that right right and I find like what I most benefit from your work, I think, uh, Paul, it is how you sort of like bring an insider's look at a religion. Because I don't know, from being somebody that was raised sort of outside of a religion, 
and, and now sort of like tentatively trying to peek my way back in. <laughs> uh, there's the, a lot of components that you are like these ideas that sort of build up about the religion it, itself that uh, as you kind of come towards it a little bit closer, you realize just sort of how unfounded they are. Like I, there's kind of this idea within like the atheist community that whoever, whatever like heads of a religious, uh, in a, anybody in a religious uh, headship position sort of just spouts off whatever they want and then all of their followers just just take it to the nail. But uh <laughs> they've obviously never been in a real church. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um Jonathan Edwards was kicked out of his church. You, you look at almost any significant <laughs> Christian leader, they were given mm -hmm. the boot at some point or hated terribly. It's just <laughs> natural. Yeah, they were they were schismatic. Yeah. Yeah. Called a heretic, definitely. John, are there questions from the from? Uh -huh. the yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, we've got a couple questions coming, and uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I've, I've listened to some of your like uh, commenting on uh, your your own church. How you'll have some of those older ladies that, whose the church life is their entirety of like what what they're mostly focused on. <laughs> it's probably just not the case that you can just say anything and then they'll just buy it you have to do a lot of sort of working around i'm sure well i when i was when i, I wasn't here too long and we did a vacation bible school and i was like well i'll, I'll teach an adult class and so i, I was going to do that was back at sort of the end of the seeker phase and so i was going to do a workshop on marriage and i very quickly realized i was sitting in a room with a bunch Bunch of women in their 70s many of whom have been married multiple times and i was going to talk to them about marriage they ran yeah. me around that room they, they, they were not about to buy anything i mean they're not going to let this young kid come in there and talk to them like that it's, but but hey you know it was great fun mm -hmm. and some of those women joined the church <laughs> yeah. i mean at least i mean if you can't be smart at least be honest yeah, that's yeah. always good advice. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's like uh, I, in your conversation you had with um, uh, Adam Friended regarding like the Brett Weinstein sort of conversation. You, you did a lot of like sort of insider baseball there and that was really fascinating and just kind of seeing what what the differences are between especially sort of like this Petersonian type religion where like somebody sort of has a, a religion of one <laughs> like even for Peterson's own case, he became a, a pastor to a church of one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, and the difference between that and, and actually having sort of a collective community that you can sort of workshop things together with each other. Like you yeah. commented about how like different parishes will try different things and then sort of like communicate with each other and be, be able to sort of like figure out what works and sort of move forward with that. That yeah. I just don't think is really there for all these sort of like Oh, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Like right. when you're actually not part of any sort of like broader community. Right. If there's, if there's nothing you can get in trouble for, you're <laughs> not really in community. Mm. Oh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah. That's just the, the way it is. Yeah. Cause there's no real, there's no real pressure on you to, to conform in any way or do anything other than what you feel like doing. Nobody I has guess. any influence. Right. right. Yeah, I guess there wouldn't really be any heresies if you're the one making up all the doctrines. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, totally. the church of me, you know, that, that's not a great church. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what is it? There's like a Mitch Hedberg joke. Like, I taught myself how to play guitar, but turns out I'm a really shitty teacher. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we got a, a question for, from Mark Angelotti. Uh, of all the tenets of Christianity, are there any that you wish weren't there? The tenets of Christianity? Yeah, yeah, I guess like doctrines or maybe even practices too. Oh, hell, that's the easy one. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, the, the doctrine hell? of hell? Sure. Internal damnation? Yeah. <laughs> Would you prefer if it was just sort of an annihilist, uh, annihilist, or what, a lot, annihilationism? Or I forget. Annihilationism. Yeah, there yeah. you go, Craig. Or maybe a universalism that was sort of widely accepted. I, I, I don't know if it works without hell, and not for the reasons people think. And and you know, C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce 
yeah. is a is a really fascinating book. It's that's one of his books that's really gotten dated because he makes so many different references to contemporaries that many of us don't have any inkling of. But the the fact that you know the idea that God finally saying to to people, I won't bother you anymore. You just you just do you. Mm-hmm. And I won't I won't impinge upon you with any of the um, with any of the and any of the friction that my uh, creation and my my glory within creation um, limits you by. Oh, yeah, that's hell. But is it? You know, when you when you look in. I mean, if you think about this long enough, you begin to say, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate the problems with hell, but I don't know that you're so easily just going to eliminate it from the, from the fabric of the, of the theology. You know, nobody wants to see, nobody wants to imagine someone being alienated from God but that is in fact how we are. And, you know, yeah. What, what, would, would I like, would I like God to move over and let me be God? Yeah. Yeah. That'd probably get old fast because I want someone who's a lot, who's a lot better and smarter and stronger and wiser to be God than I am. And that's mm-hmm. just recognizing myself. Right. And I, there was something you said in one of your recent videos that I, I really liked that, like, are there things that God does that I don't like? Like, sure. Are there things that I, I, I'm okay with that God probably doesn't like? Yeah, my sin. Like, <laughs> that's certainly yeah. the case. It's by definition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, I, I had probably a, a major question, I, I think, that is, uh, forgive me for probably not being able to articulate it quite right, but Within, let's say, more liberal religious circles, I think there's sort of this uh, openness and availability there to sort of uh, work in conjunction with other religions that are out there. So like in, in sort of, if you have sort of a liberal understanding of Catholicism, you could ha- be best friends with, say, like a, a reformed Jewish person or something like that. I actually know somebody like that. Uh, or, or like be able to, I, I think the, the, the element to a religiously held identity that if it's held to a strong degree uh, becomes exclusionary such that like you can't, it, it, it's like wanting to, I guess, a, convert all the other people that are sort of in your own circles. Um, and, and which is great. Like it, I understand like why that's important for people that to sort of share the same sets of values and, and narratives with, with each other. But I, I guess my question is like, is it possible to retain sort of the strong identity uh, within a religion while also being able to cooperate with those of different religions as well? Well, Paul definitely think- does that. So let's hear how. Well, I do that. I I think knowing who you are is foundational for successfully relating to others. If if you don't know who you are, you very quickly start projecting um, onto the other person. It's it's. You know, C.S. C.S. Lewis made a comment that that I that I ran into lately. That when he was reading history, when he'd look at two sides that were fighting each other, mm-hmm. what what people in history usually miss is the great commonality that these two warring parties had. They couldn't see what they had in common, and so a lot of people who imagine that. And depending on what we mean by liberal, this stuff is really hard to talk about because you know I I, I prefer Peterson's openness personality right. trait 
I think that's a little bit better than liberal because that tends to mm -hmm. get into political right and left. Yeah, right. people um, automatically think of that as political liberal. A, a person who knows themselves well can understand where the lines are between themselves and another person and isn't threatened by the other person. It's the person that is insecure or uncertain of their own identity, of their own beliefs. The person who has a weak self, is, it's that person that, um, that, that can't work productively with others because they very quickly start becoming the other and then realize they're losing something of themselves and then have to claw back. You see this, you see this when you watch people who can't get along with others. And, and if you pay some attention to why they can't get along with others, it's all because of stuff in themselves. So it, it has less to do with the, it has less to do with where their beliefs lie on an imaginary religious or political landscape and probably has more to do with the security with which the person understands where they stand so you're not, on a you're landscape. You're not threatened by, it's like, for example, my wife and I don't agree about anything politically, but I'm not in the slightest bit threatened by any of her opinions about politics. Right. Because I just listen to what she thinks and I know what I think. So, you know, that's, and, and it's even a paradox because in some ways, the more committed you, Paul, are to your Christianity and your Christian cause, the more open you have become. You're less dogmatic and you're more inclined to be kind of an open Peterson-esque, like, hey, let's just have a chat for two hours about, you know, whatever. I can, so. I can think over here because I know where I will come back to. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I can threatened. try on other things. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, none of us are as firm as we'd like, but I can try on other things because I still know who I am. And, and yes. the, I was in fact, the video I'm working on that may or may not see the light of day, I never know with any video, but the, the difficulty that, that we see today with people with identity is they, they're, they're uncertain as to whether there is actually, let's say a substance or an essence to themselves, And so they're always, they're, they're not, um, they're not pilgrims, they're tourists. But when they be when when in Rome and they're doing like the Romans, they think they become Roman. Mm. They they don't have a foundation, they don't have a base. And that's and I think this is why this is why you will never count out religion, because what religion offers people is a base and that base is established in many ways by a community you're not a thing all by yourself you're only a thing together with others and in a religion you now are have continuity not only in a, a community now but through history it's a tremendous advantage yeah yeah, yeah, that's a good point. And, and I, I think that's kind of the thing, too, is especially where people are sort of like losing their, um, I guess, identity in, in the here and now, there's almost like this, at least within some young, young people, a, a return to the more archaic religions, such as like orthodoxy or, or Catholicism, just because there is sort of that uh, ain't that that history to them, and there's That's even right. people like paganism is returning, and I think there there's a, part of a component to that where like people want to be inside the 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 identity of their their ancestry and their nation and, and like their location for where they live. So important to people, despite all of modernity, really. And and I think you know to go back to some of what Craig and I were talking about. That a lot of that relies just psychologically on your parents and their parents. And you know, some of it is some of it is obviously biological, but a lot of it has to do with I know who I am. And if I know who I am, I don't have to be you. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm me. 
<laughs> also, so, the, I, I think the, a point you made that I thought was really on point is it's the insecurity of that identity. Like, for example, in, in modern history, um, you know, Germany became known for its rabid nationalism because they were so late in the game yeah. to becoming a nation. Yeah. You know, in 1871 is when Germany became Germany. Yeah. And so then you have rabid nationalism in Germany where England been around for a thousand years. Yeah. People had been English and cultivating their national identity. So yeah. they're really insecure about it. And that yeah. insecurity leads to that type of rigid ideology, ideology and that fanatical commitment because you're, you're, you're scared. That's there's, right. there's, there's a fear there. That's right. And, and when you watch, people get really upset when they feel themselves losing themselves. And, and they don't even know what their self is. And that's, that's what we see happening all the time today with people. And this totally. is why people say, well, Christianity and religion is going to disappear. Uh, that's not what the data says. <laughs> nope. Nope. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, like how you were kind of mentioning how having that identity strongly held kind of allows you to operate with the other people because you know where you, you stand. <laughs> I was reminded of uh, uh, what the highly conservative uh, Catholic author G.K. Chesterton. I think like every every Sunday or something, like he would have tea with the, the Marxist a materialist H.G. Wells. <laughs> and they, they were apparently good friends, always kind of debating, but but still able to sort of cooperate with each other in, in certain ways. Well, like and, fam famously, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill was the same thing. Mm. <laughs> well, and you know, the Jews have manifest this for centuries. Um, you know, in, in the United States, for example, within, you know, in the East Coast, there, in the West Coast too, there are very few communities as committed to the welfare of the city as the Jews. Well, I think they can do that because they know who they are. And they're always a minority, but they know who they are. And so they can, you know, they can, they can act with, with uncommon generosity and often self-assurance. And um, the, the one place where they seem to have difficulty doing that is the place where they're not a minority, <laughs> which is in Israel. So right. that's right. funny. Are there more questions, John? Um, let's see, not really so much a question, but I, I guess kind of a thought from Gavin, uh, the resurrection would have been easily falsified by the Pharisees and Jewish chief priests if it didn't happen. Their silence about Christ having risen speaks volumes of the historicity of the event. Uh, what, what are your sort of thoughts there, uh, Paul, on kind of the historical cases that can be made for the resurrection? I, I think N.T. Wright's observation is a good one in that the, the, the best witness for the resurrection is the church itself. And even, you know, Gary Habermas will make this point, even the, um, e even a lot of people who, who won't talk about a bodily physical resurrection will assert that something happened to the disciples that led them to go and live the kinds of lives they lived and their followers and their followers and their followers. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine that this was, this was just a con that they were putting on, especially given the description of the disciples in the gospels, which is that they're, they're faithless misfits. I mean, when you, when you look at, when you look at the way, how it's, still is recorded how you know and and that the disciples didn't record this but the 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 disciples of the disciples wrote these stories about peter getting told get behind me satan you don't have in your mind the things of god you know uh, uh, you know this is the guy upon which you're going to build all your credibility and, you know, the New Testament just isn't written like a book where a group of conspirators, conspirators decided to huddle and get their story straight. So, yeah. I, and for me, you know, for, for me, how the resurrection works in my life is, is that it, you get to a point and you realize that 
a lot of really common things, marriage, parenting, Christian discipleship, is tremendously costly and is not and is, is not terribly in alignment with common personal selfishness. And so if you're going to do things that are really in the thoughts of many people quite sanely, not in your best interest, you need a justification. And the resurrection provides that. It says to me, I don't need to chase money and sex or fame or experiences of self-fulfillment and all of these things for my life because in fact um i what what i'm experiencing now is just the beginning of whatever it is that god has in mind for me in the future and so i can i can do the kinds of things that even atheists stop and say yeah i wish people would treat me that way i wish i i wish people would take care of my um uncle who's now homeless and homeless alcoholic. I wish, I wish our people would go to Africa. Um, and, you know, I think, again, Tom Holland's point that all of this got started. We now, as a culture, recognize these things as being sane and um, praiseworthy because of Christianity. Mm. Be yeah. and, and I think that is because of the resurrection that I now have justification for doing things that the world would say oh that's a really good thing to do but i wouldn't want my kid doing it because i'm <laughs> selfish for my kid and mm -hmm. and that's how the resurrection functions right yeah that's, that's very good uh you want to sort of wrap up there there craig uh yeah we can wrap it up this was this was actually a fantastic conversation paul i'm really glad you came by and had a chat yeah, yeah you been, I, I told John, I said, I'm going to probably download this and post this tomorrow on my channel, if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah, that'd be fantastic. That's that's fine with me. Um, yeah, and you're I'm... welcome back. We can do this anytime you want, you know. Okay, well, Now that thanks. I know where you, I know where you live on Twitter, I can <laughs> yeah. uh, shoot you a DM, you know, in a couple of weeks and say, hey, you want to come back and tell me, you know, when you get someone interesting, I'll, I'll shoot you a DM and we can chat again okay. anytime you want. That sounds good. And, uh, you 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 don't really do the apologetics. You've only been in one or two debates, right? Yeah. Did you debate? At, you were on Adam's channel a couple times, just in interviews, I think. I, I get frustrated with a lot of the apologetics debates that I hear. You're I'd a little too a... expansive for a debate. Your 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 mind kind of works in these long thought yeah. processes. It's not like you're not a you're not a like. I don't know. Do you, I don't. I don't see debate as your type of thing. These long, genial, philosophical conversations are more your, your <laughs> where you're where you're at, right? That's probably yeah. true. I, although I, you know, I'd happily talk to Sam Harris or Matt Delahunty or Rationality Rules. I'd I'd happily have a conversation with these guys. And you, oh, know, you should try to get Dillahunty. Do you? Can you communicate with him? That'd be interesting. I'd, I have no idea. I've never I've never had any inter interaction because he him. he might be into just having a conversation and not having a debate i could see yeah, that I'd, I'd be happy doing that he seems like a fun guy to talk to i mean yeah, i enjoyed his conversation with peterson um i thought yeah, that like was that. good and his conversation with glenn uh scrivener in the uk on unbelievable i thought that was fun yeah i, was I we just had, glenn was here two weeks ago we had him on oh good good yeah i i just finally think you know i, I have a lot of I feel for a guy, you know, I know a little bit of his story because he, he he shares it and and I feel for him because, and he doesn't feel sorry for himself. I'm sure he, he, he likes the upgrades to his story that he's made, but I, having been a pastor for a while and watched people live, um, there's just something richly deep and good and fulfilling about having a sense that, you know what, this world is crazy and brutal, but I, you know, I grew up, and especially in the Dominican Republic, you see a lot of people who, they're not going to have good lives along any of the lines that we evaluate goodness. Yeah. The, the grim thing I, I, I find about atheism is that these people have no hope. And, and I, 
you know, in the Dominican Republic, I we have this crazy thing about we have communion in front with just a few people who are on good standing with the church and we're all down there on the floor and watching people's feet. And, you know, these, these people believed in Jesus in ways that I never will because what was on, what was at stake for them was everything was everything. Yeah. And here in North America, you know, gosh, we have it good. And, um, I, I would have a hard time living in a universe where those people, where their short, hard lives meant nothing. If, wow. if the universe is like that, I am going to be, I don't, I don't know what that would do to my heart. I don't want any part of it. Yeah, I kind of came to that same conclusion way back when in my 20s when i was reading existentialist philosophy i kind of said that the same heart logic if if that's really what it's all about i don't want any part of it yeah it's, it's it and and i always felt deep inside of me and not in a fake way but that that there's something really awesome and profound and great about life in truth yeah. truly yeah. not as like oh i hope there is but like you know there really is and every once in a while you come in contact with it and are overwhelmed yeah. by it. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And well, you thank reminded... you guys. Yeah, Paul, this was great. It's a fantastic conversation. Yeah, it's really good. So I'll I'll download this from your channel and I'll uh, I'll post it tomorrow. I think I think peeps on my channel will really like it. Cool. All right. Cool. Yeah. Okay, Paul. Take care. All right. Bye bye.